Hi, my name is Methat Al Masri. In today's tutorial, we will learn some of the most important data annotations that are used when modeling a simple class in ASP.NET. Some of these annotations pertain to validations, others pertain to database related schemas and constraints, and yet others pertain to data formatting. Although all these concepts work for both ASP.NET MVC and Razor Pages, we will be using Razor Pages in this tutorial. Let us get started. So in a terminal window, run the following command. We're going to create a Razor page targeting the .NET 6.0 framework, and we're using individual authentication. The output directory is going to be annotations demo. If you're using individual authentication without specifying the database, it's going to create an application that supports SQLite. Having done this, we can go into the directory that was created. For our application, we will be needing two packages. So let us install those packages. The packages that we'll be needing are, the first one is the code generation package, because we're going to be generating pages using this particular package. And the other one is SQL Server. Now you might ask, why do we need SQL Server if we're using SQLite? For some reason, you need this package in order to generate your pages using the code generator package. So I'm going to install both of these packages in my application right here. Now let's start our editor. In my case, I'm using VS Code. So I'm going to type in code dot. It's going to open for me the source code in VS Code. I will not run this application because we all know what it does. Note that we have a database that has been created, AppDB, and this is a SQLite database. And also note that we have some migrations here. These are the entity framework migrations that pertain to the identity framework. In other words, the users, the roles, the uh, relationships between roles and users and so on. I will create a new folder here for my model. The name of the folder is going to be models. And in this folder, I'll create a new C sharp class student. I will use the new notation for namespaces and delete all of this. And I'm going to load my student class from code that I already have. And I will explain to you what that code does. So here is my student class. I will resolve all of these namespaces. And I'm good. So let's get started to explain each one of these. This annotation here will specify that when the table is created in the database, we want it to be called public school student. Otherwise, the table will be called students. We may want to override that so we can use this annotation. And this annotation is a class level annotation because you put it right over the class. Here's another annotation and the annotation index specifies the index that we want to be created in the database on a specific column. Here we're saying we want an index created on the school column. And the school column is here, this school column. Let's go through all the others. Key. Now, by default, if you have a column that is named ID or the name of the class followed by ID, it is immediately considered to be a primary key. But if that is not the case, like in our example here, I want student number to be the primary key and that doesn't follow what I just said that it's not called ID and it's not called student ID, it's something else. So you have to say to entity framework that I want this to be the key. So you annotate it with key. Now we have an example here of a composite key. For some reason, we decided that the primary key for this entity is going to be a composite key comprising student number and school. So we looked at school down here. Therefore, if you want the composite key, you have to add the key annotation to both of these 
columns. So we have key for student number and key for school, and each one has a column order. And this specifies the order it maintains within the composite key. So the composite key will have student number as the first column, and then it would have school as the second column. Next, let's have a look at this annotation required. Now, this required annotation means that the user has to enter information or data for first name. The error message is optional. If we remove this and put the required annotation by itself, then if the user doesn't enter information, he or she will receive a default error message. Otherwise, we can customize the error message by putting this here. Now, this error message says that placeholder zero, which happens to be the display name of this column, will be entered in this place and you'd get the message is required. Let's look at this annotation. This is the display name that we want given to this column. Of course, it is not user friendly to say first name without a space in between. So we're saying the display name will be first space name. This is the way that this column will be represented in your application. So this is going to be the display name. So this error message here will read first space name is required. Let us look at this annotation here. This is an annotation that combines the maximum length of this column, first name, which we want it to be 30, and the minimum length, which we want it to be five. Let's make it two. This placeholder two pertains to the minimum length, and placeholder one pertains to the maximum length. So the error message will read, first space name must be between two and 30 characters. Let's continue. This is new, the regular expression. The regular expression here will validate the data entered for last name. In this particular case, this annotation says that we need a maximum of 40 characters. Now, this really shouldn't be 40. We should make it 30 because it needs to match the string length here. And this regular expression really means that the only allowed characters in this field of last name are letters or spaces, and that's it. It will not take any numbers. It will not take any special characters. Let's look at this annotation here. Now, we have a property called full name, and it is a calculated field that combines first name and last name. So we do not want this to be mapped in the database. This is only for the purposes of the application, not for the database. So we can put the annotation not mapped. We discussed the fact that school is a part of the composite key. That is why we have key and column order two. But this is new, max length and min length. You can compare max length and min length with the string length annotation where actually we had the min length, just like this one, and the max length was this first number. If you don't want to use string length, you can actually use max length and min length. And you can put them on the same line, or if you don't want that, you can put them on separate lines. It doesn't really matter. So this is fine too. The next annotation is this column. You give it a name, and a, if you want, the type name is optional. So what we're saying here is that even though this column is called comment in our application, we want it to be given the column name note in the database. And when the database is created, we want this column note in the database to be given type and text. Here, database generated. This means that we want the value for this column date created to be generated by the database. We don't want to enter it. When the data is inserted in the database, we want the database to give it a date or a timestamp. So we would add this annotation database generated and the database generated option will be computed. 
Now this is a two-step process because just putting this over the column doesn't necessarily generate the date. We must add some code inside of the application DB context to tell it what function it should call in order to generate the date. We will do that later in this tutorial. Let's go back and look at the other annotations associated with date created. We have a display name and the display name is just so that in our application we don't need to call it date created. We'll keep it simple and just call it created instead. Now this is new display format. If you don't give it a date format, it's going to give a default and that is a combination of the date and the time. Suppose you don't really want the time, you just want the date. So you can put a display format and say that the data format string is this, where zero is the placeholder and this is the actual format. So the format in this case is going to be the month, the day and the four digit year. As far as the weight is concerned, there is a new annotation here, which is range. So the range annotation specifies the starting number and the ending number that are allowed for a particular numeric field. And these numbers, they happen to be inclusive. So the weight column can only accept between 10 and 1000 with the minimum and maximum values being inclusive. You can see here that the error message has three placeholders. The first placeholder will be filled by the display name for the column. The second placeholder will be filled by the minimum value for the range. And the third placeholder will be filled by the maximum value for the column. We have another field here, email, and there is this annotation data type where you can specify exactly what type of data this is. And of course, we want this to be email. Therefore, when the user enters data, it's going to validate it for an acceptable email address. We have another field here called email confirm. And this is so that when the user enters the email, there's another field to make sure that the user enters the right email by having the user confirm the email. So what we do here is we can say compare email so that when you enter the email confirm, it is compared to the email and it's validated such that both are equal. Here, just like we did with email, we want the data type to be email address and we want the display name to be confirm email address. Finally, we have another annotation called scaffold column. This is to exclude a column from being scaffolded when you use the code generator. For example, this could be the name of the photo file name of the student, and you may not want it to be scaffolded when you use the code generator. So you can come here and say scaffold column false. In other words, do not scaffold this. The next thing we need to do is to find the application DB context class, which is in the data folder. We want to add this property so that the student list becomes a student's table in the database. The next thing we need to do is to add this on model creating method. And I did mention earlier on that there must be some logic here to tell the database how to auto-generate the date created. This here is the code that we need to enter in order to tell the database how to generate the date. In the case of SQLite, the command for generating the current date is this, date now. If you are using SQL Server, you'd replace date now with get date because this is the proprietary command in SQL Server. So you're saying here for entity student property date created, this is the default value that has to be generated by the database. Here we have another thing that we also need to tell the database. What we specify here is the composite key for the student table. And the composite key is a combination of student number and school. 
So this is important in combination with what we did here when we specified the student number as a key and the school also as a key. So these two have to go together. At this point, we can now create a new migration because we have changed the model. The migration that exists now only knows about the identity framework. Now we have to add another model that specifies the fact that we have a new student class. So we'll create a new migration using entity framework. So that would be .NET EF migrations add and we'll give it a name say student and we'll say the output directory is data slash migrations. So we have a typo here. I'll just put T that's missing and off we go. So that seems to have worked. Let's now peek into the migration that was created. So the migration that was created is this one here. And you can see now that the table that's being created is called public school student. Just like I said, I wanted it to be because over here I said I want the table to be called public school student. The key, it is a composite key between student and school. And down here, we said that we needed an index based on school. And here it's creating an index, create index based on column school. Let's look at the other fields here. You will see here that with school, I did mention that my school column, which is down here, I wanted it to be 60 columns long. So you can see it actually made it 60 columns long, max length. First name is 30, last name is 30. The note, notice what has happened here. I did say about this comment field that I want it to be created in the database as a note column. So that's exactly what it did. It created a column called note and I also said that I want it to be of type end text. Now the date created we specified the fact that it has to be auto generated by the database and this is what it's doing because it sets the default value to be the output from this function call inside of the database. Now the compare validation and all that stuff the data types and all that that happens not in the database, but it happens when you use the application. So you can see here it did exactly what we wanted it to do. So the next step is to update the database. So I can go .NET EF database update and hit enter. This will create those artifacts in the database. Let's have a look. So we have here the database in app.db. I have this extension that I added that allows me to see the contents of the database. It is the SQLite by Alex CVZZ. So let's go back in here. I can right click on AppDB and choose Open Database. It will open for me this tab at the bottom here. I can expand this and these are all the tables and we have this one table that we created, Public School Student. And you can look at the schema here. Let us now create our UI for adding, updating, deleting, and listing data. So to that end, I will go back to my terminal window and I will execute a command that's going to generate for me the pages. So this is the command that I will be using with this ASP.NET code generator utility. I want to create a razor page on the model student the database context class is application db context and minus ul means use the default layout. The output directory will be pages and under there it's going to generate another folder called student pages. And here you're saying add the reference script libraries. So let us take this, copy it and go into the terminal window and execute this. When it's done, it's going to tell us that it created all of these pages. It did the create, it did the edit, it did the details, it did the delete, and finally the index page. Let us run our application, .NET Watch, to run it in watch mode. So we see this page, and of course, since we didn't create a menu item for our students, we don't see any students here. 
but we can go to the page if we want to by typing in student pages and this will give us the student page. Let us add student to our menu system. So let's go back to our source code, go under pages, shared and open up layout.cshtml. Let's add another menu item over here and this will read something like this. We're going to say here that the ASP page is going to be student pages followed by index and that the word student is going to be displayed. I need to restart the web server and if I go back and run this, we get back to our home page. If I click on student, it should take me to student. Now let me click on create new. Let's check some of the validations and the annotations that we added. For example, we said that student number is an integer. If I try to enter any characters, it's not going to take it. So let me enter one, one, one here. For first name, let's go back and look at restrictions we put on first name. We said that first name has to have a minimum length of two characters. So let's go into our app and try to enter just one character. And if we tab away, it's going to say the field first name must be a string or array type with a minimum of length of two. So we can't have one characters. So let me just enter the word Fred here. And then for last name, we said that it has to be a name without any letters according to the regular expression. So let's say I try to enter 99 here. It says only letters allowed. If I enter Smith, that should be fine. But if I try to enter star, for example, it says only letters allowed. So I have to enter names or spaces. Let's say Smith O'Brien, and that should be fine. For school, we don't have any restrictions other than the fact that it's going to be part of the composite key and it's got a minimum and a maximum length. So I'll say school, let's say public school or something. For comment, the only thing is in the app, it's called comment but in the database, it's called note. This is great. For email, let's try to enter something that's not an email. So it's going to say, please enter a valid email. So let me enter aa at aa.aa. .aa. And now we have this confirm email. Let's say I put here bb at bb.bb and I try to create. It's going to tell me confirm email and email do not match. So I have to get both of them to match. And if I click on create, it inserts for me the data in the database. Notice that we do not have in this list the student number or the school. For some reason, it doesn't put it here because they are both keys. But you can always change the code and add a column for the student number and the school. Now, there's another more serious problem than that. And that is that if you click on edit here, or details or delete, nothing happens. This is because the parameter that's being passed to the code behind is not exactly the way that the code behind expects it. So there's a problem on the HTML page and there's a problem also on the code behind page. Let's have a look at the index page for our students. So it would be in here and index.cshtml. You will see here that this is the razor syntax that links to the edit detail and delete pages. This is not entirely correct and it does not represent the way we want to do it. We want to pass both the student number and the school because these two, they represent the key. So I'm going to comment this out. I will replace it with something else which is this. Instead of the helper method action link belonging to HTML, I'm going to use simple anchors and the ASP page is going to point to edit for say the edit and details for details and delete for delete. I'm going to pass two values for my routes. The first one is going to be ID and it's going to be the student number and the other one is going to be school and it's going to be the name of the school. And I do the same for all the others. Just to make sure, I'm going to stop the web server and restart again. 
So now if I click on student, click on details, let's see what is being passed. What's being passed to the URL here is the ID and the school. This is what we want. Let's look at the code behind for edit and you will see here that it's coming to this method. And this method is only accepting the ID, but we have to get it to accept also the school. So I'm going to say string question mark school. And when it checks for the student, it has to also check for the school in addition to the ID. So I'm going to add end m dot school equals to school. This is more correct. Let's go back, refresh, go back to our home, student, edit, and now it is picking it up properly. So this change, we have to apply it not only to the edit, but also to the delete details pages as well. So I'm done with edit. Let me go to details. I'm going to do the same thing here. I'll replace this with what I just copied from edit. And I'm going to go comma here and string school because we have a composite key. Let me go into delete. Do the same thing here. Comma, string, school. Put a question mark here because it could be nullable. And paste this. So now I think we're in much better shape. Let me refresh by hitting Control R so it restarts the server. And go back into our home page. Check edit. Let me change the name to Jones here in capital so we can see it easily. And sure enough, it changed that. Let's look at details. Details also seems to work. And let me look at delete. So if I say delete, it's going to crash. So why is it going to crash? Because in the delete.cshtml.cs file, line 51, it is searching only by ID. And we don't want it to search by ID. It's got to search by ID and school. I mean, this actually tells you the problem here. Entity type student is defined with a two part composite key, but one value were passed to the find, which means we need to go back to delete code behind and line 51, which is this one. Now I still have in memory the same command that I was copying from one page to another, which is this. So we're going to check on student number and ID. And over here, I have to say, comma string and this will be school and this is being passed from the form so it should be fine let me say all here to restart the web server and we can try it here it is it deleted it let's just make sure that that's really working properly so i'm going to go one two three here first name i'm gonna say a's last name b's school c's and then D's for comment and email would be F's and create. Let's see the delete works and sure enough it works. I hope you found this video useful and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. In the meantime, take care.